Today I would like to resume my series of sermons on Vatican II, this being the sermon concerning the error of religious liberty. <clears throat> and because of the length of the subject, it will have to be divided into two sermons, one given this week, the, ne the other next week. Now first, let us review briefly the errors of Vatican II that we have already seen. The fundamental error consists in an error about God, that he is present in a supernatural way in all men without any distinction, and that it is the role of religion to merely remind people of the presence of God in them, to extract from them a religious experience. This corresponds to what St. Pius X called immanentism in his condemnation of modernism in 1907 in the encyclical Pascendi. This error of immanentism gives rise to ecumenism, which is the second great error of this council, which is that all religions, being fundamentally an outgrowth of this interior religious sense, ought to come together and form a great amalgamation, setting aside their dogmatic differences. Ecumenism calls for a dogmaless humanitarian church, and the Vatican II religionists have been gradually changing the Catholic religion into a dogmaless humanitarian religion. Ecumenism gives rise to the error concerning the church that we saw, that the Church of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church are not exactly the same thing, but that the Church of Christ is a much broader religion or church, taking in, as the Council says, all who look with faith toward Jesus. And from this error concerning the church, con comes the error of saying that non-Catholic religions are a means of salvation, a teaching which is explicitly contrary to the teaching of the church, the dogma of the church, that outside the church there is no salvation. And now we come to the heresy of religious liberty, which is an outflow from what we have just said, that all religions are in some way legitimate, all religions lead to God. The conclusion is the heresy, which states that all men have a right to profess whatever religion they see fit according to their individual consciences, and that they have a right to practice these religions in society, and a rightly ordered society is that which guarantees religious freedom to all. This is explicitly stated by the document concerning religious liberty and is said over and over again by John Paul II. Now, let me give you a little background concerning religious liberty. <clears throat> Before the French Revolution and the so-called 18th century enlightenment, which led up to it, the idea of religious liberty was unheard of. The idea that you have a right to believe whatever you want. It was unheard of. Not in the history of even paganism did you see states adopt the idea that it doesn't matter what religion you profess or that the state should profess no religion unheard of. And therefore, you do not see any condemnation of it in the church's teaching until the 19th century. Now, there was a great deal of religious toleration, but religious toleration is not religious liberty. Religious toleration is to tolerate as an evil a false religion in order to avoid a greater problem, say, perhaps a civil war. And so even in Catholic countries, Protestantism 
and other false religions were at times tolerated in order to avoid civil war. That is not to say that you have a right to do that. But that what you are doing is an evil to which you have no right, but something which we are merely tolerating to avoid a more serious evil. For right comes from God. If you have a right to do something, it is a moral faculty. That is, it is a power from God to do something. And God cannot give a right to do something wrong. That would be against his essence. God cannot give you a right to embrace error, a right to embrace heresy. That would be against his essence, against his truth. I am the Lord thy God, he said, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. He did not say to Moses as the first commandment, I communicate to all men the right to believe whatever religion they choose. But with the French Revolution and the American Revolution and American Constitution, there came a new social order in which all religions were placed on the same level and in which the state was indifferent to all of them. This was a hotly discussed manner, a matter at the Constitutional Convention in this country in 1788 and 1789 because even the Protestants were scandalized by Jefferson's suggestion that the state be indifferent. Even the Protestants were scandalized that how can you have an indifferent state, a state that does not profess a religion? Jefferson was a deist. He was a, a Freemason and a deist. And they, the Protestants were so scandalized by what he said that they accused him of being a non-believer, that is, an atheist. Yet the system of Jefferson prevailed. This required that the state recognize in each individual what is known as a freedom of conscience and a freedom of religion, understanding by that a right to profess both as an individual and as a society whatever religion one pleases. There appeared in the church, therefore, in the 19th century, a phenomenon known as liberal Catholicism, the proponents of which held that the new social principles were not incompatible with the church's teaching, that somehow the church could make peace with these new principles, that there was nothing wrong, there was nothing against the first commandment. This in some way did not contradict what the church taught. These were known as the liberal Catholics in the 19th century. And because they were vocal and more importantly, because some of them were clergy and even high clergy, such as bishops, it was necessary for the Pope to condemn this doctrine. And this doctrine of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion and with it freedom of press and freedom of the speech of speech were condemned, all of these doctrines were condemned, particularly by Pope Gregory the Sixteenth in 1832 and by Pope Pius IX in 1864. Now, this is a little shocking and alien to us because we have learned from our culture that things like freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech are sacred values values which the Constitution holds in, in great reverence and which all good Americans should hold in great reverence. But in fact, these are inventions of the enemies of the church. These are inventions of Freemasons of the 18th century, people like Voltaire, people like Diderot, the encyclopedists, people who plotted the very destruction of the church that we are witnessing with our eyes today. People who plotted 
like the, the Illuminati and, the, and Adam Weishaupt and others who plotted to put a pope on the throne who would be in accordance with their own liberal ideas. And these writings can be found in the early 19th century. And so these ideas come forth from these people. And so Catholics must divest themselves of these evil ideas because they come from people who are the enemies of the Catholic Church. But nonetheless, there was always in the church a group of people and not a small group who said, no, we can somehow incorporate these things into the Catholic faith. So the Pope saw it necessary to condemn. Pope Gregory XVI in 1832 said this concerning indifferentism and religious liberty. He said this shameful font of indifferentism gives rise to that absurd and erroneous position, proposition which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. It spreads ruin in sacred and civil affairs, though some repeat over and over again with the greatest impudence that some advantage accrues to religion from it. But the death of the soul is worse than freedom of error as St. Augustine was wont to say. When all restraints are removed by which men are kept on the narrow path of truth, their nature, which is already inclined to evil, propels them to ruin. Then truly the bottomless pit is opened from which John saw smoke ascending which obscured the sun and out of which locusts flew forth to devastate the earth. Thence comes transformation of minds, corruption of youths, contempt of sacred things and holy laws. In other words, a pestilence more deadly to the state than any other. Experience shows, even from earliest times, that cities renowned for wealth, dominion, and glory perished as a result of this single evil, namely immoderate freedom of opinion, license of free speech, and desire for novelty. Now, Pope Pius IX in 1864 made an even more, made a stronger condemnation of the same principles. He said, but although we have not omitted often to proscribe and reprobate the chief errors of this kind, Yet the cause of the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls entrusted to us by God and the welfare of human society itself altogether demand that we again stir up your pastoral solicitude, he is writing to bishops, to exterminate other evil opinions which bring forth from the said errors as from a fountain, excuse me, which spring forth from the said errors as from a fountain which false and perverse opinions are on that ground the more to be detested because they chiefly tend to this, that that salutary influence be impeded and even removed, which the Catholic Church, according to the institution and command of her divine author, should freely exercise even to the end of the world, not only over private individuals, but over nations, peoples, and their sovereign princes, and tend also to take away that mutual fellowship and concord of councils between church and state, which has ever proved itself propitious and salutary, both for religious and civil interests. For you well know, venerable brethren, that at this time men are found not a few who, applying to civil society the impious, an absurd principle of naturalism, as they call it, dare to teach that the best, the best constitution of public society and also civil progress altogether require that human society be conducted and governed without regard being had to religion any more than if it did not exist or at least without any distinction being made between the true religion and false ones. And against the doctrine of scripture, of the church, 
and of the Holy Fathers, they do not hesitate to assert that that is the best condition of civil society in which no duty is recognized as attached to the civil power of restraining by enacted penalties offenders against the Catholic religion except so far as public peace may require. From which totally false idea of social government they do not fear to foster that erroneous opinion most fatal in its effects on the Catholic Church and on the salvation of souls called by our predecessor Gregory the sixteenth an insanity namely that liberty of conscience and worship is man's personal right which ought to be legally proclaimed and asserted in every rightly constituted society and that a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty which should be restrained by no authority whether ecclesiastical or civil whereby they may be able openly and publicly to manifest and declare any of their ideas whatever either by word of mouth by the press or in any other way but while they rashly affirm this they do not think and consider that they are preaching liberty of perdition and that if human arguments are always allowed free room for discussion there will never be wanting men who will dare to resist truth and to trust in the flowing speech of human wisdom whereas we know from the very teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ how carefully Christian faith and wisdom should avoid this most injuri injurious babbling and he affirms these condemnations with his apostolic authority. And I was reading very recently that the theologians of the time took these condemnations to be an ex cathedra, solemn, infallible statement of the Pope. Both for the fact that he used this language, which I am about to say, and for the fact that all of the bishops took this document and preached it and taught it in their dioceses and taught these doctrines as condemned. He says at the end of this encyclical, amidst therefore such great perversity of depraved opinions, we, well remembering our apostolic office and very greatly solicitous for our most holy religion, for sound doctrine and the salvation of souls which is entrusted to us by God and solicitous also for the welfare of human society itself have thought it right again to raise up our apostolic voice therefore by our apostolic authority we reprobate proscribe and condemn all the singular and evil opinions and doctrines severally mentioned in this letter and will and command that they be thoroughly held by all the children of the Catholic Church as reprobated, proscribed, and condemned. And despite this, Vatican II will teach that each man has the right to freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, and that a rightly constituted society is that which provides for the practice of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. This is as much of a contradiction as to say that man has a right to practice birth control. For Pope Pius XI in the 1930s declared that birth control was evil and condemned it and cited sacred scripture against it. And again, the theologians of that time took that to be an infallible statement of the Pope. It would be as much a contradiction of Catholic doctrine to say a man has a right to practice artificial birth control. As it would be to say a man has a right to liberty of conscience and liberty of religion. They are both on the same plane of the teaching authority of the Catholic Church. But next week I will show you why this doctrine was ignored, why 
there persisted the liberal Catholics in the church who said that this is a legitimate doctrine, that this is something that is livable with regard to the Catholic faith, and why, therefore, in 1965, on December 7th, 1965, Paul VI signed into effect this dreadful doctrine of religious liberty, thereby giving the kiss of death to the council. For it was its kiss of death to contradict previous Catholic doctrine. It is a sure sign that that is not the teaching of the Catholic Church, a sure sign that the Holy Ghost was not operative in that council. It was the final act of the council. It was the last thing to be done, and it was its kiss of death. And next week I will point out to you just exactly how they, they contradicted this teaching of the Catholic Church. Today I would like to continue the sermon of last week concerning religious liberty. Last week we saw that the following things were solemnly condemned by the church. First, that the best condition of public society and also civil progress altogether require that human society be conducted and governed with regard with no regard being had for religion any more than if it did not exist. Second, that the, it is the best condition of society in which no duty is recognized as attached to the civil power of restraining by enacted penalties offenders against the Catholic religion, except so far as peace may require. These are direct quotes from Pius IX. Furthermore, it is condemned that liberty of conscience and worship is each man's personal right, which ought to be legally proclaimed and asserted in every rightly constituted society. And it is furthermore condemned. And Pope Pius IX said it is against the scriptures, it is against the teaching of the church, and against the teaching of the Holy Fathers. This, that a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty, which should be constrained by no authority, whether ecclesiastical or civil, whereby they may be able openly and publicly to manifest and declare any of their false ideas whatsoever, either by word of mouth, by the press, or in any other way. Now, what does Vatican II affirm? Vatican II affirms what we have just heard condemned by the authority of the Catholic Church. In paragraph 2 of the document of religious liberty, it says, this Vatican Synod declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all men are immune from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups or of any human power in such wise that in matters religious no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs nor is any one to be restrained from acting in accordance with his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others within due limits. The right of the human person, the document continues, to religious liberty is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed. This is to become a civil right. So what the council calls for then is a civil right to act entirely in accordance with your beliefs, whatever they should be, and that the, the government, and for that matter not any human power, has the right to come in and to hinder you in any way from acting in accordance with your beliefs. And this is what is precisely condemned by Pope Pius IX. Listen to Pope Pius IX again. This is condemned, that a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty, 
which should be constrained by no authority, whether ecclesiastical or civil, whereby they may be able to openly and publicly manifest and declare any of their false ideas whatsoever, either by word of mouth, by the press, or in any other way. And <clears throat> lest anyone say that we are giving a bad interpretation to Vatican II, if we look at the pronouncements of Paul VI and of John Paul II subsequent to this document and what they themselves have done with regard to changing the status of the Catholic Church in Catholic countries, we understand that this is the meaning, that people have a right to do and to profess whatever religion they please in civil society. The most recent example of this is the fact that John Paul II himself rejoiced at the fact that a mosque was built in Rome, that this was a, a wonderful thing that the people who profess the Muslim religion now can have a place to worship in Rome. Now, this principle of immunity from coercion in religious matters has been condemned by the church in many other places. The church sees as the best situation in society that which that in which the Catholic faith is recognized by the government as the one true faith, which was true in all societies in which the faith was prevalent before the French Revolution, and that the government ought to take means to repress the profession and propagation of false religions. And that was true in all Catholic countries before the French Revolution. And as I have said before, the church does foresee situations in which false religions may be tolerated in order to avoid a more serious evil. But toleration of an evil is not a civil right. If an evil is tolerated, that does not mean that it is a civil right. If you have a civil right, that means that before God and before society, you have a right to do something that is a, a right to not be coerced against what you feel you want to do. Now, Leo XIII condemned this principle. He said, it is therefore not permitted to bring <clears throat> to light and to expose to the eyes of men that which is contrary to virtue and to truth, and even less still to place this license under the tutelage and the protection of the laws. Now that, that is directly contrary to what Vatican II says. <clears throat> Leo XIII also said, it is just that the public authority use its solicitude to repress untrue doctrines, the most fatal pestilence of all for the mind, in order to prevent the evil from spreading out for the ruin of society. Pope Pius XII said, What does not correspond to the truth and to the moral law does not objectively have any right to existence or to propagate, or to action. Pope Pius VII said, referring to the revolutionary constitution in France, which gave freedom to all religions, not only, he says, is the freedom of forms of worship and of conscience permitted there, to use the very terms of the article, but there is promised support and protection to this liberty. And besides, to the ministers of what are called the cults, by the fact itself that the liberty of all the cults without distinction is established, truth is intermingled with error, and the holy and immaculate spouse of Christ 
outside of which there can be no salvation, is put into a class with heretical sects and even with the Jewish perfidy. Moreover, by promising favor and support to the sects of the heretics, one tolerates and favors not only their persons, but also their errors. It is, the Pope continues, implicitly the disastrous and forever deplorable heresy that St. Augustine mentions in these terms. And here is the quote of St. Augustine. Quote, it affirms that the heretics are on the right path and speak the truth, an absurdity so monstrous that I cannot believe that any sect really professes it. End of quote. Now, this signing and promulgation of this document, which is the last of the council, is the kiss of death for Vatican II. On December 7, 1965, Paul VI placed his signature on this evil document, saying at the end, Each and every one of the things set forth in this declaration has won the consent of the fathers of the most sacred council. We too, by the apostolic authority conferred on us by Christ, join with the venerable fathers in approving, decreeing, and establishing these things in the Holy Spirit. And we direct that what has been enacted in synod be published for God's glory. And put his signature to it. Now, in saying this, Paul VI was attaching this teaching of Vatican II to the universal ordinary magisterium of the church. For whenever, a, whenever the pope and the bishops together, whether dispersed throughout the world or whether in council, teach with authority, then that is known as universal ordinary magisterium, and it is infallible. But this magisterium has contradicted the previous magisterium of the church. And because the previous magisterium of the church is the object of our faith, this contradictory magisterium must be the object of our dissent and our repudiation. It is as if they said our Lord is not present in the Holy Eucharist, or Christ is not God, or Our Lady is not immaculately conceived. Because these doctrines are the object of our faith, then what contradicts these doctrines is the object of our dissent and our repudiation, our condemnation. For light automatically excludes darkness. But because the teaching of authority of the church cannot contradict itself, the only possible conclusion is that Paul VI, despite appearances, did not have the apostolic authority which he claimed to have, and that the council was devoid as well of teaching authority. For the teaching authority of the church is the teaching authority of Christ. They are not two authorities. He who hears you hears me. And it is unthinkable, even blasphemous, that we would say that the teaching authority of Christ could contradict itself. For the truths of God are eternal. And hence, because they have used their, their supposed teaching authority to promulgate that which is contrary to the teaching of the church, we must conclude that they did not have that teaching authority. In effect, that the Holy Ghost was not at that, at that council, 
that the Holy Ghost did not assist Paul VI by the power of the keys to promulgate Catholic doctrine. And this means that the whole basis of the new religion, which is Vatican II, is bogus and illegitimate. It also means that those who attempt to foist Vatican II upon the Catholic faithful are bogus and illegitimate pastors, that is, those who claim to be popes or bishops, since they who intend to promulgate error to the church and to the human race as a whole in the name of Christ cannot receive from Christ an authority to teach, an authority to rule, and an authority to sanctify. For then Christ, in so doing, would deceive the human race in giving them the authority to teach, rule, and sanctify in his name, and at the same time promulgating error, it would mean that Christ would be deceiving the human race and leading the human race into error. And therefore we are bound to say by the faith that those who attempt to foist these errors upon us do not enjoy the authority of Christ. Now this discussion of religious liberty comes appropriately on the Sunday of the Last Judgment. This doctrine of religious liberty is that most impious doctrine that wishes to enthrone as a civil right, and remember, all right comes from God, as a civil right, the right to blaspheme Christ, or the right to be an atheist, for the document even mentions atheists, that they have this right. The right to trample on the Holy Eucharist, For it would be a religious matter if somebody, for example, some Protestant said, it is my duty to trample upon the Holy Eucharist in order to show that this is nothing but bread. And Vatican II is defending his right to do that because that is a religious matter or defending the right of the Muslims to say that the Trinity is excrement, as they say, or the right to call Our Lady a harlot. That is what this impious doctrine defends, that God has given men a right to do such things. But on this Sunday, we are reminded of the last judgment, which recalls to us the authority of Christ, his coercive authority, by which he will severely punish all who have had contempt for his truth or who have violated his law. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.